Okay, this is an abridged version of the next chapter of my completionary tome called Ishka Ajun and the Case Against Modern Japanese Literature. Uh, the uh, full version, of course, includes copious footnotes and lots of other information that will not be included in this short video, uh, but it should give you an idea of what Chapter 5 is about. And Chapter 5 is called Ishikawa's Tripart Theory of Writing. I will include links to my uh, recitations of abridged versions of other chapters in the description below. All right, Chapter 5, Ishikawa's Tripart Theory of Writing. It begins with the epigraph, Form and content are the most hackneyed concepts under which anything and everything may be subsumed. Martin Heidegger, The Origin of the Work of Art. Form and Content in Writing, the title of the essay, was first published in May 1940 in the third issue of the academic journal Gendai Bunsho Koza. Two years later, it was included in Ishikawa's monograph, Bungak Taigai, A General Approach to Literature, 1942. This chapter argues that form and content in writing, despite its discursive and meandering style, constitutes a robust theory of bunsho, or writing, in three modes, descriptive, prescriptive, and valuational, laying the groundwork for his apophatic theory of the shosetsu put forth in what constitutes a tonpen shosetsu, which I discussed in, which I discussed in the next chapter. Readers will want to keep in mind that the Japanese term bunsho, usually translated as writing or written text, is used by Ishikawa in several senses. At times he deploys the term simply to denote writing in general, other times he uses it to evoke a particular notion of pure prose, or what we might call écriture. The three specific senses of écriture, according to Baldick, are writing as style, writing as an intransitive activity which is self-directed about itself as language, and writing as difference, as opposed to the illusory authenticity of speech. And those three specific senses chime with Ishikawa's self-reflexive and graphocentric conception of language and literature. All right, first section. Ishikawa's descriptive theory of writing, Bunsho, four fundamental conditions. In the first section of form and content in writing, uh, called The Workings of the Written Word, Ishikawa outlines what he regards as the four basic universal conditions for all writing, or bunsho, namely... Uh, where do we go? Writing or bunsho, namely materiality, autonomy from speech, groundedness in a concrete living language and culture, and public orientation. Let us start by examining these three, four are these four exceedingly obvious points, as he calls them, and then turn to the sections on pure prose and literary value. Ishikawa's first point is that writing is a material, and thus also a visual, phenomenon. He starts by noting that Japanese, like all languages, began as a purely spoken medium and existed for centuries as such. But with the arrival of Chinese characters in the late 4th and early 5th centuries AD, Japanese came to acquire a thingly character, to borrow Martin Heidegger's phrase, transmogrifying into a complex system of writing that required various instruments and tools for its creation. To constitute writing, Bunsho, Ishikawa writes, characters must be transcribed on a sheet of paper with a pen, brush, pencil, typewriter, or some other tool that employs India or Western ink to give the script its shape. He notes how these unwieldy tools, or scoundrels of materiality, as he calls them, are highly prone to insubordination. In order to maintain the upper hand, quote, man must routinely reconquer, sai safeku, them, end quote, lest they start to exert too much influence. The constant need for technological innovation, moreover, per begins to impact human consciousness and perception itself, which is then just as much shaped and reshaped in the process. If language had remained a merely spoken medium, this is again in quotes, man would never have encountered these obstacles or clutched these weapons, end quote. As Ishikawa puts it, for it is here, in writing's ineluctable materiality, that the fundamental difference between writing and speech comes into sharp relief. Writing is never a simple graphic snapshot of speech, which is why transcriptions of conversations and speeches cannot be regarded as writing, end quote. Ishikawa's second point is that writing, as a visual material phenomenon, 
belongs to an altogether different order than that of speech. As I discussed in chapter 2, Ishikawa was deeply skeptical of the Genbun Ichi style invented and propped up in the Meiji, early mid Meiji period as the official national language. Though he does not explicitly mention Genbun Ichi, his remarks are clearly aimed at this new vernacular style that sought to dissolve the long standing division between writing, of boom, and speech, gen, while privileging the latter. The seeds of this valorization of speech over writing can be traced to the Kokugaku, the national learning scholars of the Edo period. But it was in mid-Meiji that modernizing officials and educators combined the Edo dialect with newly imported concepts and grammatical features from Western languages to prioritize the vernacular style as the official written language. Opposition to the new style and its displacement of older modes arose almost immediately, starting with the King Yusha school in the late 1880s, as I discussed in Chapter 2. This was followed by even more radical challenges from symbolist poets in late Meiji, Taisho modernists and the new sensationists, or Shinkan Kakuha, writers of the early Showa period, each challenging from different angles the notion that writing can be pegged to speech. As a successor to these challenges, Ishka used his works to attack the illusions of Genbun Ichi ideology and its Shajitsushugi foundation while simultaneously exploring various alternatives. His basic orientation might be described as Genbun Fu Ichi since he consistently stresses the non-unity, the fuichi, of speech and writing, genbun. In contrast to both Edo period Kokugaku scholars and his own neo-romantic contemporaries, he harbored no kotodama shinko, no belief in the existence of certain auspicious words called kotodama, or word spirits, that supposedly exert a magical effect on the word, world when intoned. For him, it is the written word, the ji, the bun, rather than the spoken word, the go or the geng, that represents the true dwelling place of spirit, or seishin. His graphocentric stance stems from the early education he received from his Kangaku scholar grandfather in the Chinese classics, which taught him that the relationship between the written word and the world is not a one-to-one -one perfect correspondence, but rather always mediated and conditioned by various cultural and material factors. Though the movement to abolish the traditional division between writing and speech did not begin in earnest until the mid-Meiji period, Ishka finds an early conspicuous example, Ichijirushi Dei, of it in the later works of Takizawa Baking, uh, the late Edo author best known for his epic novel Nanso Satomi Hakken Deng, The Chronicles of the Eight Dog Heroes of the Satomi Clan of Nanso, 1814 to 1842, are the years uh, that uh, work was written. Iska is critical of how Baking, after going blind late in life, orally transmitted to his Amanusis his celebrated Yomihon for transcription on the grounds that his rec recitative approach conflates writing with speech, producing not bunshou proper, but a combination of metered verse, imbun, and grandiloquent oration, yubeng, that has little to do with prose, end quote. <coughs> Ishikawa's frequent criticisms of Bakin, who experienced something of a boom during the war, is grounded in his view that Japanese literature outgrew this phase of orality long ago, maturing into a complex freestanding system that operates according to, quote, the laws of convention that have been consolidated and amended over the long course of writing's history, end quote. He warns that any attempt to bypass this entirely new set of laws, by which he means the unassailable laws of rhetoric, grammar, syntax, stylistic conventions, idiomatic norms, is doomed to fail. Quote, even the most cavalier writing that, uh, that tries to circumvent these laws and blaze a new path invariably will end its, will find itself unable to escape the influence of these codes of law. If language had been merely a spoken medium, writing would never have to grapple with such restrictions." End quote. Ishikawa's third point is that writing, as a material visual phenomenon distinct from speech, is possible only in and through a concrete living language that has developed over time in a specific historical community. To corroborate, he cites the counterexample of Esperanto, the international language invented by a Polish ophthal ophthalmologist L.L. Ophthalmologist, Zamenhof in the late 19th century, which he regards as an inauthentic pseudo-language. 
Esperanto had been a hot topic among progressive intellectuals in Japan ever since anarchist Ōsugi Sakai confounded the, uh, co-founded the Japanese Esperanto Association in 1906. Nitobe Inazo, the prominent polyglot writer and diplomat best known as the author of Bushido, The Soul of Japan, 1900, developed an interest in Esperanto after attending the World Esperanto Congress in Prague in 1922, and later joined others in urging the League of Nations to adopt it as their official language. In 1928, the left-wing federation of proletarian writers known as Nippona Artista Proletaria Federatio, or NAPF, Zen Nihon Musansha Geijutsu Denme, All Japan Federation of Proletarian Arts, was established. By the time Ishikawa penned his essay in 1940, Esperanto had already had a relatively long history whose developments Ishikawa had been following since his youth, but he ultimately came to reject Esperanto on the grounds that it was no more than an official, artificial construction, citing Anatole, Anatole France's remark that while the blood of every Frenchman courses through the French word sang, no human blood has ever flowed through the Esperanto word sango. End quote. Iskawa declared that, quote, even if Esperanto suddenly became the world's lingua franca tomorrow, what would ultimately remove us about compositions written in that language would not be their ostensibly universal nature, but rather the fact that they were forged from the vital energies of the lifeblood of man. When it comes to writing, there is always the inexorable stipulation that it must be inextricably bound to the particular, to lived human experience and to a specific national language in order for even a line of it to come into being." End quote. In short, Iskar regarded Esperanto as a failed experiment, a lifeless abstraction that could never attain the status of a living language, which can emerge only from the determinate historical experiences of a particular people and cultural milieu. For him, there is no avoiding the fundamental fact that the Quote, writings of a given nation are inextricably tied to the language of its na native soil, and thus it follows that the particularities of a national language are writings only refuge. And yet, paradoxically, writings universality manifests itself precisely at the point where it commits itself to the particular." End quote. Ishikawa's remarks here may seem to veer close to the discourses of the ethnic nationalism that was ubiquitous at the time. After all, he seems to be arguing that what refines and purifies language is the blood of the minzoku, the folk, or the ethnos, that such purification is possible only in and through the lived experience of this ethnos, and that the ethnic nation is the only starting point for authentic culture. He even couches his remarks in the concept of fudo, uh, feng de, in Chinese, an ancient Chinese term signifying that's the wrong Chinese pronunciation, but um, an ancient Chinese term signifying the mysterious life force of the region or soil that moves in harmony with the seasonal cycle. Philosopher Watsuji Tetsuro famously appropriated this concept of, in his seminal work Fudo, Ningen Gokuteki Kosatsu, Climate and Anthropological Inquiry, 1935, and redefined it to, to denote the climatological patterns that he believed constituted, quote, the structural movement of human existence. This overdetermined essentialistic mode of anthropology, which came to be known as Fudogaku, or climatology, held that the ostensibly uniform and trans-historical ethos and sensibility of the Japanese people was the result of the country's geographical traits, especially its monsoon climate and mountainous topography. And yet, in Ishikawa's defense, he is not claiming that the contingent forces of nature and native environment are something benign or salutary, or even necessarily determinative. His point is that they serve as an, quote, impediment in the road ahead, a reserve army waiting to chasten any newfangled avant-garde writing that seeks to blaze its own path, end quote. Hemmed in by these external impediments, the writer must struggle against them to produce a work that transcends its inherited circumstances. Language is for him not some pure abstraction, as Zamenhof, the inventor of uh, Esperanto, had imagined, but rather a complex organic system forged and refined over centuries through the lived experiences and practices of a historical community. By extension, literary work is not something that stands above or outside these immediate material and cultural pressures, but rather what remains after the writer has wrestled with them, 
as he puts it, quote, writing, you see, is a living entity, a discrete phenomenon, but it is also a constituent part of the composite body called culture, which produces it, and is therefore fated to be swallowed up some day by that very culture. While this testifies to the sheer magnitude of its power, it also speaks to the difficulty in getting writing to achieve full autonomy, end quote. By emphasizing both writing's rootedness in a specific cultural order and its impulse toward universality, Iskall sets himself apart from his contemporaries who preferred to retreat into the essentialistic notions of uniqueness. He saw the subtleties and contingencies of national culture, culture not as an end in themselves, but as the only possible gateway to the universal. To repeat his paradoxical formulation, quote, Writing's universality manifests itself precisely at the point where it commits itself to the particular, end quote. Ishikawa's fourth point is that writing, as a material visual phenomenon grounded in a concrete living language and linguistic community, is a radically public activity. It always presupposes a specific audience, an interlocutor, a reader, an addressee, a broader social community. This is true even for the most seemingly private or intimate forms of writing. Ishikawa highlights this fundamental element of all writing in order to expose the delusion at the heart of subjectivistic modes of writing that see writing as the external expression of interiority. In his view, quote, there is ultimately no such thing as purely private writing, just as there is no such thing as individual or private spirit, seishin, end quote. To illustrate his point, he cites the famous series of letters that the poet Kitamura Togoku sent to his soon-to-be wife, in 1887, thus initiating the modern genre of koibumi, or love letters. In his view, quote, the rousing love confession moves its recipient not because of the particular hue of the heart laid bare, or the accuracy of the orthography, or the mastery of the penmanship, rather it moves the addressee because of the potential workings, because of the potent workings of spirit, seishing, that infuses it. Indeed, only the spirit is capable of moving even a total stranger, end quote. Iskala's remarks here are not dissimilar from those put forth a decade later by T. S. Eliot in his 1953 essay, The Three Voices of Poetry, and I quote Eliot here, A good love poem, though it may be addressed to one person, is always meant to be overheard by other people, end quote. Like Eliot, Iskala disavows the notion that there can be purely private writing and spurns modes of reading that approach the text as pure reflection of interiority. At this point, I should say, I should say a word about two key terms in Iskala's critical lexicon, shindi, or psychology, or ego, or identity, I sometimes translate it as, so shindi, and seishin, or spirit, or geist, or numa. Uh, which he sees as the two sources or principles behind all artistic creation. On the one hand is shindi, usually rendered as psyche or psychology and more literally translated as principles of the heart or mind. Ishka uses this term to denote what we might call the author's subjective economy or identity. That is, the author's psychological disposition, personal tastes, sexual proclivities and inclinations, emotions, moods, and so forth, depending on the context. Ishikawa's use of this term recalls Tsubouchi Shoyo's notion of ninjo, or human feelings, pathos, which, as I discussed in Chapter 2, constitutes, along with Setai and Fuzoka, Setai is society and Fuzoka's customs, one of the three mimetic objects in his famous triadic formula. Shindi often carries negative connotations in Ishikawa's writings, which has led some critics to describe Ishikawa as an anti-psychological or Han Shindi writer, who privileges the metaphysical, the keiji jōgaku, over matters of psychology and identity. While shindi is the driving engine behind autobiographical fiction and lyrical poetry, it can never produce Ishikawa's notion of pure prose, as he explains in an oft-cited passage from what constitutes a tanpen shōsetsu, which is the subject of my next chapter, uh, I quote here, The writer's own psychology, Shindi, is merely an impediment that obscures and obstructs the perdurance, the perdurance of his creative energies and effort. And the less the authorial psychology intervenes, the better the, and purer the work will be qua shosetsu. Generally speaking, what sustains the world of the work is not the author's individual ego, but rather the trans-individual substance called spirit, seishin. 
the writer cannot merge with spirit except by severing his own ego, his own shindi. And it is only through confrontation with the real that spirit can take shape and become manifested in the work. End quote. By contrast, Ishikawa deploy, deploys the term seishin, spirit, guys, numa, to signify the collective, trans-historical force that drives the creation of all authentic bunsho. This raw, elemental, pneumatic force supersedes the individual, traverses, all, in, traverses and informs all cultures, and manifests itself in and through language, that prison house, as Nietzsche once put it, uh, that all writers are condemned to inhabit. In short, Ishikawa believes that the writer is free only in a limited sense, to the deg degree that language is a vast symbolic matrix that orders and conditions the writer. Writing is a conservative enterprise, bound by a set of inexorable laws that are established over time through repetition, usage, custom, and convention. Ishikawa's view recalls that put forth over a century early by, earlier by Johann Wolf, uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang von Goethe, in his favorite sonnet Natur und Kunst, Nature and Art, 1800, which ends with the lines, All culture is like this, the unfettered mind, the boundless spirit's mere imagination, for pure perfection's heights will strive in vain. To achieve great things we must be self-confined. Mastery is revealed in limitation, and law alone can set us free again. And Quote from that poem, first two stanzas, I think. For both Goethe and Ishikawa, spirit, seishin, geist, numa, expresses itself most freely within law alone, the confines of the clearly delimited parameters of a cultural tradition. Next section, Ishikawa's prescriptive theory of writing toward a notion of purified prose. In the second section of Form and Content in Writing, uh, titled That Which Kills Writing, That Which Animates Writing, Iskara sets forth his notion of pure prose or écriture by adumbrating the four factors that corrupt it, over proximity to speech, over reliance on ritualized conventions known as kata, over developed technique, and poetic residue. Though he does not explicitly mention the term Junsi Sambung, pure prose, he is clearly pointing toward a notion of prose that is purified, purified or distilled of all corrupting elements. His aim is effectively to do to prose what French symbolist poet Paul Valéry did to poetry, to purge the medium of its non-essential elements. But where Valéry argued for a pure poetry free of all external or non-poetic, i.e. prosaic referential narrative elements. Ishikawa calls for a purified prose that is stripped of all inessential, i.e. non-prosaic elements. We shall begin by situating Ishikawa's notion of pure prose within the historical context of the various discourses on purity and contamination, paying close attention to, paying close attention to how Ishikawa's ideas both relate to and differ from these earlier configurations. Nowhere is Ishikawa's concern with purity more evident than in this essay. The modifiers Jun and Junsi, meaning pure and or uncorrupted, appear at least a dozen times. His concern reflects the widespread preoccupation with notions of purity that characterize the high cultures of e Europe and East Asia beginning in the second half of the 19th century. In the West, this pining for purity was a distinctive feature of modernism in its various manifestations. Similar poets such as Stéphane Mallarmé and Paul Valéry sought to purge poetry of all purportedly impure or inessential elements. Composers Arnold Schoenberg, Anton Webern, Webern and Alban Berg strove to take music beyond classical tonality by creating new atonal and twelve-tone systems that dispensed with traditional harmonic associations and ornamentation. In the visual arts, Vasily Kandinsky and Pablo Picasso developed methods and strategies for moving art beyond mimetic representation toward realms of pure abstraction. Novelists Marcel Proust and James Joyce pursued the ideal of purity in their novels, which made use of new experimental techniques such as multiple narratives, free and direct discourse, and interior monologue. André Gide took the pursuit for purity to its logical extreme in his romance Pures, 
that pures that sought to do away with all impure, i.e. non-novelistic or merely referential elements altogether, as Gide's hero in Les Faux Monolieux declares in chapter 8, quote, I should like to strip the novel of every element that does not specifically belong to the novel, just as photography in the past freed painting from its concern for a certain sort of accuracy, the phonograph will eventually no doubt rid the novel of, of the kind of dialogue which is drawn from the life and which realists take so much pride in. Outward events, accidents, traumatisms belong to the cinema. The novel should leave it to them." End quote. Toward the end of that novel, Gide's narrator writes in his diary that his goal is to quote, "...purge the novel of all elements that do not belong specifically to the novel." End quote. In Japan, a similar longing for rarefied realms of art and life fueled much of the culture and intellectual activity of the late Taisho and early Showa periods. In literature, this longing manifests itself in the proliferation of terms such as Junsi Sanbung, pure prose, Junsi Shosetsu, pure novel, Junbungaku, pure literature, and Junsi Geijutsu, pure art, intended to mitigate the corrupting influences of political ideology and mass culture. In the elevation of the eye novel as the ideal me medium for such pure literature. In the founding of the Akutagawa Prize in 1935 to promote such punitively pure works. And in the countless works that dramatize this desire to escape the modern world and self and retreat into imagined spaces of pure sensual or aesthetic experience. The quest for purity also extends to fields beyond the domain of literature. It inspired the creation of the pure film movement, Jung Ega Geki Undo, of the Taisho period, whose star directors Kaede Yama Norimasa and Tanaka Eizo worked to move cinema beyond mere entertainment and melodrama by adopting dram dramatur dramaturgical techniques and shedding the use of Benshi commentary. It pervades the writings of the Kyoto school philosophers such as Nishida Kitaro, Nishitani Keiji, and Watsuji Tetsudo, who strove to, quote, overcome modernity, Kindai no Chokoku, by imagining a world free of all modern conceptual systems, such as positivism, capitalism, nationalism, socialism, realism, naturalism, and individualism. In fact, as early as the late Meiji period, Nishida, the central figure of the Kyoto school, had already begun to develop his concept of Junsi Keiken, or pure experience, in his first book, Zen no Kenkyu, An Inquiry into the Good, 1911, which drew from William James' notion of a realm of unmediated experience. Tropes of purity and contamination also permeate the political writings of the day, which abound in ethno-racialist discourses about the putative ethnic purity, Minzokujoka, and pure blood, Junketsu, of the Japanese race. Without going into too much detail, suffice it to say that this valorization and pursuit of purity was a hallmark of Japanese thought and art of the period, and that Ishikawa's call to distill prose of all corrosive and inessential elements must be understood within this larger cultural and historical context. More specifically, Ishikawa's essay tacitly engages a series of highly publicized literary debates that took place during the interwar period. In these debates, prominent writers and intellectuals wrestled over key contentious issues of the day, often splitting into the two rival factions of those who privileged Keishiki, style, form, expression, and those who privileged Naiyo, referential content. The first and most pertinent to our discussion uh, was the content value debate, the Naiyo Teki Kachironso of 1922, which I shall return to below. That year also saw the one declaration debate, the Sengen Hitotsu Donso, in which prominent bourgeois writers Arishima Takeo and Hirotsu Kazuo argued over whether political revolution and class struggle or the detached pursuit of pure art, Junsi no Geijutsu, should take priority. The pure arts theory debate, the Sanbun Geijutsu Donso of 1924, began with the publication of Hirotsu's essay Sanbun Geijutsu no Ichi, the position of prose art, 1924, which articulated his art-centered position, evolving into a feud between fellow aestheticist Sato Haruo and Nietzschean intellectual Ikita Choko over whether art or life is primary. The I novel and mental state novel debate, the Watakushi Shinkyo Shosetsu, Watakushi Shinkyo Shisu, Watakushi Shinkyo Shosetsu Donso, 
This is a very famous debate, the I novel and mental state novel debate, it's often translated as, uh, of 1924 to 1925, was prompted by the publication of Nakamura Murao's essay, Honkak Shosetsu to Shinkyo Shosetsu to Authentic Novels and Mental State Novels, 1924, which praised the objective style of what he called authentic novels, or Honkak Shosetsu, while criticizing the subjective style of recent mental state novels, or Shinkyo Shosetsu, triggering responses from Ikita Choko, Kume Masao Uno, Uno Koji, Sato Haruo, and Hirabayashi Hatsunosuke. In the novel Plot's Debate, Shosetsu no Suji Ronso of 1927, Akutaga Ryunosuke and Tanizaki Junichiro battled over whether writers should aim for plotless poetical narratives that follow the associations and movements of mind, or the architectural beauty of tightly crafted plot-driven stories. The debate ended abruptly with Akutaga's suicide on July 24th of that year. These contentious disputes culminated in the famous pure novel debate, the Junsei Shosetsu Donso, of 1935, which began with the publication of Yoko Mitsu's Riichi's essay Junsei Shosetsu Dong, essay on the pure novel, which sought to restore the primacy of art in the wake of the rise of proletarian literature, prompting responses from over a dozen prominent writers, including Nakamura Mitsuo, Moriyama Kei, Kawabata Yasunari, Kobayashi Hideo, Aono Suekichi, and Takami Jim. Okay, this, that paragraph just runs through very quickly all of the major uh, debates that have to do with this idea of purity of the era. Uh, entire books could be written on each of those debates. Um, next paragraph. While Ishikawa's remarks on purity reflect the concerns and terminologies of these earlier debates, his formulation of the issue stands out in several crucial ways. For starters, he differs from art supremacists like Hirotsu Kazuo, and that his aim was not to create a hermetically sealed realm of pure art by purging writing of all social and political content. Nor did he, receive, nor did he conceive of purity in terms of authorial intention and mimetic fidelity to lived experience in the manner of the I novelist. His aim, rather, was to delineate a new kind of prose writing that could overcome the tension between art and praxis, the disjunction between Keishiki and Naiyo through his notion of unconscious content, Ishiki Sadezaru Naiyo, and the resultant rivalry between the formalists and pragmatist factions, while exposing and clarifying the four elements that corrupt prose. That corrupt prose. Keeping in mind this broader context and motivation, let us turn now to Ishikawa's description of pure prose while attending closely to the following questions. How does Ishikawa deploy the tropes of purity and contamination? How does his conception of pure prose differ from putatively impure forms of writing? What exactly are the impure or contaminated elements that he wishes to cleanse writing of? To what impure mode or discourse is it being closed? Okay, next paragraph. Ishikawa's first condition for pure prose is that it must recognize writing's fundamental autonomy and separation from speech. Building on his comments outlined in the preceding section, he describes writing as a mode of linguistic communication governed by a wholly different set of laws than those of colloquial speech. He rejects, for example, the popular speech mimetic approach advocated by writers such as Musha no Koji Saneatsu, Sato Haro, and Uno Koji, who believe that writers should write as people speak, and who, quote, take this mantra to be the ideal for writing prose. In Ishikawa's usage, the verb shaberu, shaberu, to speak, often carries pejorative connotations akin to the English verbs to chatter, to prattle, and is implicitly contrasted with the loftier and more rigorous activity of writing, Bunsho. His script-o-centric orientation, which is a core pillar of his case against modern Japanese literature, disallows the possibility of any unification of writing and speech, and thus has more in common with the views of modernists such as Yoko Mitsurichi, who argue that the writer should write as one writes, kakuyoni kaku, rather than to write as one speaks, shaberyoni kaku. To illustrate his point about the fundamental non-unity of writing and speech, Ishikawa cites the famous scene from Molière's play Les Bourgeois Gentilhommes, first performed in 1670, in which the philosophy master gently mocks his cre credulous social-climbing pupil Monsieur Jordan 
by telling him that all speech necessarily qualifies as prose. Though Iskar only briefly alludes to the scene, here is the full relevant passage. Philosophy Master. No, sir. Everything that is not prose is verse, and everything that is not verse is prose. Monsieur Jordan, and when one speaks, what is that then? Philosophy Master. Prose. Monsieur, Monsieur, Monsieur Jordan. What? When I say, Nico, bring me my slippers and give me my nightcap, that's prose? Philosophy Master. Yes, sir. Jordan, by my faith. For more than 40 years I have been speaking prose without knowing anything about it, and I am much obliged to you for having taught me that. I would like then to put into a note to her beautiful marchioness. Your lovely eyes make me die of love, but I want that put in a gallant manner and be nicely turned. End quote from that play. In contrast to the philosopher's tongue-in-cheek claim, Iskar disputes the notions that speech is simply untranscribed prose and the writer's task is to em emulate typical conversations. He accuses those who fall to novels for not sounding real enough of being captured by a phonocentric or logocentric view of writing that fails to grasp the pure and simple nature of the written word. End quote. To expand on this farther, Iskar writes, quote, that the written word possesses a pure and simple nature insofar as it has already been washed clean of the physiology, the ego, the shindi, and all other attributes associated with its author." End quote. The implication is that a new evaluative standard is needed, one that is free from both the phonocentric criteria of naturalness and the tendency to reduce the work to the author's own life and personality. There can be for him no direct or necessary cor correlation between literary value and proximity to speech. Writing is authentic precisely to the extent that it is unnatural, unidiomatic, artificial, and removed from com common speech, a point that he would reiterate later that year in his essay, Akubu no Mediocre, The Char Charm of Bad Prose, 1940. His own writings of the period, replete with serpentine, sprawling sentences that defy the norms of idiomatic speech and easy recitation, testify to this. Iskar's second condition for pure prose is that it must be free from an over-reliance on kata. Often translated as established conventions or ritualized and ritualized gestures, kata is a key term in traditional Japanese arts denoting the codified patterns of a form or genre. While Ichikawa sees such fixed models and conventions as an inevitable outgrowth of the East Asian literary tradition's propensity for concision and economy, he recognizes that this propensity can also pr produce what he calls the ossification of expression, hyogen no kote, which occurs when language petrifies into stock phrases, dead metaphors, and hackneyed cliches. The more an expression or pattern is repeated, the more formulaic it becomes, losing its original force and rigor. For prose to reach the level of pure prose, it must break out of the molds and conventions that continuously, that it continuously accretes. And the failure to do so, he warns, effectively marks the death of prose, and indeed the death of writing, end quote. While strict adherence to normative models and conventions may be necessary in some traditional literary forms, it can only exert a corrosive effect on his conception of modern prose. It is precisely this stultifying effect of codified conventions that Ishgard criticizes in his discussion of Muro Kyuso, the Neo-Confucian philosopher from the Edo, early Edo period, uh, whom British scholar W.G. Aston once called the Socrates of Surugai. In Ishgard's view, Kyuso's classic collection of essays Shundai Zatsuwa Conversations at Surugai, Surugadai, 1750, which addresses a wide range of subjects from Chinese metaphysics and ethics to Japanese history and poetry, epitomizes how Kanbun Kicho, or Kanbun style, the pseudo-classical Chinese style of prose used for centuries by educated classes, privileges, quote, privileges, euphonic phraseology and poetical force over accuracy and precision. Kotobazuki to, kotobazuki to kse no sandan dake de. Citing a passage where Kyuso's alter ego narrator, the venerable old man, Okina, 
explains to his young pupils the meaning of one of his Chinese-style poems. Iskar explains how this stilted style, along with its close relative Huase Kanxi, Chinese prose written by Japanese poets, belong neither to prose nor poetry, but instead, quote, are instances of eloquent oratory composed in traditional poetic meter, end quote. Iskar's complaint is that these two traditional styles had such a profound effect, impact, surviving into the modern period, even through the rise of Genbun Ichi, that, quote, our literary market has long flourished by simply toying with these two elements of euphony and poetical force, end quote. Iskar's conception of pure prose is by contrast founded on a recognition and affirmation of the fundamental tension between the need for traditional forms and the desire to break out of them. Iskar's third imperative for pur pure prose or écriture is that it must be free of excessive technical, ref technical refinement. Writing's propensity for concision and economy naturally facilitates the evolution of technique. But technique is a double-edged sword. It can either sharpen the potency of expression, or it can sap writing's precision and vitality. A certain roughness and lack of polish is essential to enhance the overall impact of a work. Iskar cites two examples to illustrate his point. First, he quotes a passage from floral artist and author Nishka Isote's Fudu Seikatsu Zichte, The Stylish Lifestyle, a Zichte, 1934, that compares the relative merits of Zen poet painter Sesson from the uh, late, uh, just before the Edo period he died. Uh, Limpa school painter Ogata Koring from the early Edo period, and the eccentric painter Ito Jakuchu from the uh, later half of the Edo period. He compares these three uh, painters to show that the great relative, uh, to show that the relation between technical skill and intuitive aesthetic taste is inversely proportional. The more advanced the technique, the less artful the work will be. Iska quotes Isote. Uh, quote, the evolution of technique invariably leads to the waning of artistic taste. This may sound, sound paradoxical, but in fact it makes perfect sense when you think about it. Moreover, it applies not only to tra traditional arts and crafts, but to all works of art created in an age when men's brains brim with creativity, but their technique is second-rate. For it is precisely these purportedly second-rate works that actually contain something of the sublime. Indeed, the longer one gazes at such works, the better one comes to understand their appeal." End quote. And of course, these are all my translations, because translations of this work uh, do not exist, as far as I know. End quote. The second source Ishka cites is a passage from chapter 10 of Irish novelist George Moore's semi-autobiographical account of his 15 years living in Belle Epoque, Perdi titled Confessions de un jeune anglais, translated in English in 1888 as Confessions of a Young Man, that novel is from 1886, and the quote is, Mr. Uh, the East writes, Mr. Stevenson is, com uh, to George Moore writes about Stevenson, Mr. Stevenson is competent to understand any thought that might be presented to him, but if he were to use it, it would instantly become a neat, sharp, ornamental, light, and graceful, and it would lose all its richness and harmony. It is not Mr. Stevenson's brain that prevents him from being a thinker, but his style, end quote. Moore here is criticizing Stevenson's elevated style for being so clever and refined that it gets in the way of his actual ideas and content, precisely what Isote warns against, depriving his works of the richness and harmony required of pure prose. Ishikawa's implicit point is that his own literary sensibility, which values a certain roughness and spontaneity, is closer to Moore's than to Robert Louis Stevenson's. Ishikawa's fourth essential point for pure prose is that it must be free of residual elements of verse. Poetry represents for him an earlier, primitive stage in the evolution of writing, the plaything of nymphs and shepherds, as he puts it in what constitutes a tampen shosetsu. When the essential features of poetry, such as meter, rhyme, and cadential phrasing, or yokiyo, as we say in Japanese, become accidental features in prose, they, quote, exert a corroding and corrupting effect upon prose, converting the natural energy of the words into heat, as it were, and triggering the phenomenon known as entropy, which causes writing to disintegrate and die, end quote. Iskar likely had in mind the myriad pre-Meiji prose and dramatic works that, for purposes of euphony and emotional effect, often lapse into the alternating syllabic pattern of wa classical waka, so the 575, 
77 uh, syllabic pattern. When he asks rhetorically, quote, if poetry was able to banish fixed meter no less than a century ago with the invention of vers libre, why should we not expect to do the same? End quote. When he says this, his point is that the advent of free verse, libre verse, or jiushi in Japanese, in mid-19th century France and early 20th century Japan, had a salutary effect not only on poetry, but on prose as well, freeing it from traditional prosody and its, quote, fixed meters and rhythmical stresses, end quote. Rhythm for him is a, quote, mysterious force that arises naturally from the movement of the words as they are being transcribed onto the page. The result is bound to be a disaster whenever the writer deliberately, through his own shindi, or his own ego, psyche, psychology, tries to inject rhythm into his prose. He also cites, end quote, he also cites a passage from the French poet Pierre Louis, Six Letters to André Gide, sent between 1894 and 1899, to bolster his point, quote, My goal in these poems is to create a new kind of verse that is only faintly musical, subtly Rhythmical. In short, a new kind of verse that is altogether unlike the metered verse of old. After all, what is an unmetered free verse, if not a genre of prose? It is precisely toward this notion of prose that I am striving in my poetry. Louis regards his free verse collection of poems as, quote, no more than a necessary preparatory drill in the creation of this new form of prose. And finally, last paragraph of the section, returning to the issue posed in the second half of the essay, namely uh, that which animates writing, Iskar turns to Montaigne, uh, specifically a chapter from uh, Montaigne's uh, if famous collection of essays called Essays from the late 16th century, uh, and the quote is, we must not rivet, rivet ourselves so fast to our humours and complexions, our chiefest sufficiency is to know how to apply ourselves to divers employments. Tis to be, but not to live, to keep a man's self tied and bound by necessity to only one course. The, those are the bravest souls that have in them the most variety and pliancy." End quote. Iskar is tacitly affirming that such variety and pliancy are central uh, ingredients in his own notion of pure prose as well, recognizing the necessity of established conventions without being limited by them. And the final section of this chapter, the question of aesthetic value, is probably the most important section of this cha of this chapter. Question of aesthetic value, overcoming the form content dichotomy. In the final section of form and content in writing, titled uh, here uh, the question of beauty in writing, Iskar turns to the fraught decades-old problem of whether a literary work's value resides in its keishiki form, style, expression, or in its naiyo, referential content. His response represents a bold attempt to overcome the long-standing opposition between Keishiki and naiyo by proposing a new category that he calls unconscious content, ishiki sarezaru naiyo. If conscious content, ishiki sareru naiyo, denotes the raw materials, quote, from raw materials from everyday life that the writer must hunt and gather, tansaku saishu, from the world and inject into the work, unconscious content, ishiki sarezaru naiyo, signifies all the elusive resonances and symbols that arise naturally, quote, from the stream of wit and words themselves. While the former comes into being, quote, prior to the pen, pen izen, the latter emerges as the writer, quote, thinks with the pen, pen to tomo ni kangaeru. To borrow two oft-cited phrases from what constituted Tampen Shosetsu. As we examine this final section of form and content in writing, namely essay, of this essay, let us keep in mind that the Japanese word keishiki can denote style, form, expression, method, technique, structure, genre, or more generally the literariness of a work, depending on context, and that naiyo denotes the primary referential and thematic content of a work. It was precisely this vexing question of the source and locus of literary value that Kikuchi Kang and Sato Mitong had argued over in the content value debate, Bungei Sakuhin no Naiyo Tekidonso, of 1922. 
The origin of this debate can be traced to Satomi's series of essays titled Bungye Kangen, Immature Ideas on Literature, 1920, which advocated for the primacy of artistic form and expression over social and political concerns. Satomi's series prompted Kikuchi, the influential pu publicist and Octava Prize founder who would bail Ishikawa out of jail 16 years later, to respond with an essay called Bungye Sakuhi no Naiyo Tekikachi, the content value of literary works, 1922, that asserted that a work's content value, naiyo tekikachi, which he also calls its everyday life value, seikatsu tekikachi, and divides into two types of content, intellectual, shiso teki, and moral, doutoki teki, takes precedence over its stylistic, keishiki teki qualities. As examples of works that constitute masterpieces despite their artistic deficiencies, Kikuchi cited Recent popular, popular historical novels such as Nakazato Kaizan's 41 volume serialized novel Daibo Satsu Toge, Great Bodhisattva Pass, 1913 to 1941. Satomi responded with an essay called Kikuchi Kanshi no Bungye Sakuhi no Naiyo Tekikachi o Baksu, refuting Kikuchi Kan's content value of literary works, 1922, which attacked Kikuchi's life-privileging pragmatist position, emblemized in his famous battle cry, Life first, art second, seikatsu daiichi geiji dai ni, at the end of at the essay's end, as a kind of material centrism, sozai tsugi, that valorizes extrin extrinsic value, gaizai tekikachi, at the expense of intrinsic value, naizai tekikachi, for ta Satomi, a work's aesthetic value, bitekikachi, arises from its style, which is far more important in his view than any extrinsic value. Kikuchi responded with a f final essay titled Saidon, Bungye Sakui no Naiyo Tekikachi, The Content Value of Literary Works Revised, 1922, after which the exchange petered out and the unresolved question of the locus of literary value continued as a central point of contention in the literary world. Though nearly two decades had passed since Kikuchi Kan and Satomi Ton had traded blows, the question of the locus of literary value was still in the air when Ishikawa published his essay in 1940. Ishikawa's remarks constitute a powerful response to the core issues raised in the previous debates, even if he mentions none by name. At first, Ishikawa appears to side with style privileging writers like Satomi, who considered artistic expression, keishiki, to be the primary determinant of literary value. But it soon becomes clear that he rejects both camps, those like Kikuchi who privileged Naiyo over Keishiki, and those like Satomi who prize Keishiki over Naiyo. He dubs the very framework of the debate a deformity, a katawa, since it distorts writing by placing it into uh, oppositional camps while ignoring the symbiotic relationship between Keishiki and Naiyo. The excessive emphasis on Naiyo leads writers to produce works of the emaciated type, as he calls them, hinjakugumi, while re which rely entirely on what he calls conscious content, ishika, ishiki sareru naiyo. On the other hand, he, the emphasis on keishiki leads writers to produce works of the insidious type, as he calls them, kuretsu gumi, which are stylistically compelling and well wrought, but lacking in terms of content. For Ishika, the choice between these two extreme poles was always problematic, rooted in the faulty premise that Keishiki and Naiyo are mutually exclusive rather than constitutive categories. Literary value for him derives neither solely from its stylistic aspects nor its referential content, but rather from a third category that he calls unconscious content, Ishika Ishiki Sade Zaru Naiyo, which reconciles Keishiki and Naiyo. Only by recognizing and activating this third category can the writer produce a work that attains the status of full-fledged mature écriture, which accords with the first sense of écriture, writing a style, that I touched on at the top of this chapter. Ishka begins this last section with a discussion of a passage from the famous speech written by encyclopedist and naturalist Comte de Buffon, titled Discours sur le style, 1753, and presented to the Académie Française, Française in 1753. The speech is best known as the source of the popular motto, Le style c'est Léon même, style is the man himself which Ishka takes as starting point for his discussion. 
Here is the full passage with the lines quoted by Iskar occupying the second half. Note how Buffon, while affirming the preeminence of style as a privileged source and vehicle for conveying truth, nevertheless draws a sharp division between style and content in contradistinction to Iskar. The well-written works are the only ones that, go, that will go down to posterity. The amount of knowledge in a book, the peculiarity of the facts, the novelty even of the discoveries are not sure warrants of immortality. If the works that contain these are concerned with only minor objects, if they are written without taste, without nobility, without inspiration, they will perish. Since the knowledge, facts, and discoveries, being easily detached, are passed on to others, and even gain intrinsically when appropriated by more gifted hands, these things are external to the man. The style is the man himself. Style, then, can be neither detached, nor transferred, nor altered by time. If it is elevated, noble, sublime, the author will be admired equally in all ages, for it is truth alone that is permanent, that is even eternal. Now a beautiful style is such in fact only by the infinite number of truths that it presents, all the intellectual graces residing in it, all the interdependencies of which it is composed, are truths not less useful and for the human spirit possibly more precious than those whatsoever they be that form the core of the subject. And quote from Buffon, this famous passage from the essay, or the speech. This passage contains three important claims, each of which Iskar addresses. The first is the motto, style is the man himself. Often translated into Japanese as bun wa hitonari, writing is man. This phrase became something of a proverb in modern Japan, its provenance often erroneously attributed to Kikuchi Khan, Shiganaoya, and Taka, Takayama Chogyo. While Ishika applauds Buffon for recognizing the radical potential and significance of style, he ultimately rejects the motto on the grounds that it is rooted in enlightenment humanism or personalism that regards style as an expression or function of the author's personality, while overlooking the various subterranean, natural, and cultural forces enumerated above. He counterposes this outdated personalistic view of writing with the modernist one that sees the work as an autotelic heterocosm that is generated from a specific cultural symbolic matrix and acquires a life of its own the moment it leaves the author. For Iskar, there is no person or fixed identity behind the style, a theme that he will foreground in his essay on the thought patterns of the people of Edo, which I discuss in chapter 7, chapter seven of this book. In his words, quote, What we relish and savour today is not writing that is reducible to the man himself, but rather writing that constitutes an autonomous universe once removed from the man who wrote it. In short, Buffon's slogan is all well and good, but at some point we came to reject the very individualistic foundation upon which his outdated motto stands, end quote. And, as I explained above, interpretive modes that reduce the work to a function or expression of the author's personality, identity, or psychology, shindi, are precisely what Iska is trying to liberate writing from. With regard to Buffon's second claim, that truth, or better yet, truth is the only eternal thing, end quote, Iska dismisses all, quote, such outdated puerile notions, end quote, about, quote, truth, self, eternity, and such, end quote, on the grounds that people today have long, quote, given up chasing this atomic particle known as the self, and, quote, no longer see the need to pursue such preoccupations humanistes, humanistic preoccupations, uh, end quote. He advises those who still cling to notions to, quote, sign up for the latest course being taught in the kindergarten called literature, Bungaku, end quote. Note how Iskar once again uses this term bungaku in a pejorative sense to denote modes of writing that are limited to the frameworks of self-expression and shajitsushugi, the system of copying actuality, the two perennial targets of his early writings. Iskar then turns to Buffon's third claim that writing contains two kinds of truths, content-derived and style-derived, an idea he emphatically endorses. He explains and here's an extended quote from Iskar. On the other hand, Buffon does make one claim that chimes with our own experiences. Buffon delineates the 
finer lineaments of writing while touching on the question of beauty. Uh, and he quotes Buffon here, Now a beautiful style is such in fact only about an infinite number of truths that it presents. All the intellectual graces residing in it, all the interdependencies of which it is composed, are truths not less useful and for the human spirit possibly more precious than those whatsoever they be that form the core of the subject. End quote from Buffon within Ishkar's own quote. And Ishkar continues, If we take this remark to mean that the infinite number of truths residing in a beautiful style together constitute the full reality that comes into being through writing, then we have at last found something we can fully agree with. Moreover, this line speaks directly to the question of subject matter. End extended quote. For Buffon, the infinite number of truths contained in a beautiful style, which he elsewhere calls taste and genius, are, to quote, truths not less useful and for the human spirit possibly more precious than those whatsoever they be that for the core of the subject, end quote. By dividing into two types this way and elevating the former to the seat of the sublime, Buffon refutes the notion that truth simply exists out there in the world, waiting to be culled and converted into words, thus preparing the way for later critiques of simplistic correspondence views about the relation between language and reality. To put it in the terms of terms that the content value debate of 1922 did, to put it in uh, the terms of Satomi and Kikuchi's content value of content value debate of 2022, Buffon sides with Satomi's style privileging camp over Kikuchi's content privileging camp, while Ishikawa sees Buffon as a kind of prophetic forerunner to modernism for recognizing style as the ultimate locus and substance of truth, this does not lead him to embrace or negate either extreme. Let us return for a moment to Ishikawa's dismantling of the deformed Katawa discursive schema that divides writing into the two rival groups he calls emaciated Hinjaku Gumi and insidious Guretsu Gumi. The first group, the emaciated group, it consists of works that are composed entirely of what he calls conscious content, Ishiki Sareru Naiyo, his term that corresponds roughly to Buffon's, quote, truths that form the core of the subject, end quote. The, though Ishikawa cites no examples, he is clearly referring to the myriad lowbrow novels, Tsuzok Shosetsu, period dramas, Jidai Geki, quasi historical novels, Lekshi Shosetsu, and other genres of popular literature, Taishu Bungaku, that may contain compelling or entertaining subjects, matter, subject matter, but are stylistically undistinguished. As he puts it, quote, many readers have a bad habit of reading the of regarding the core subject as the only subject, believing that as long as the main subject is compelling, then style, or keishiki, is only secondary, as though the written word were merely a vehicle for the expedient transport of content. But in fact, the stuff we call the core subject, core subject accounts for the conscious content of the work only, and any writing that consists solely of this type of content, no matter how compelling that content that subject may be, cons constitutes what I call the emaciated camp." End quote. At the end, uh, other end of the spectrum is the insidious camp, the guretsu gumi, Ishikawa's term for works that are stylistically competent and polished but lacking in terms of content. Though he once again provides no examples, he is no doubt referring to the various mental state novels, Shinkyo Shosetsu, miscellaneous essays, Ishita, Belle Lettres pieces, Bibungaku, and various avant-garde styles that valued stylistic refinement over compelling content, and as you will recall from our above discussion, excessive refinement is for Ishikawa one of the elements that corrupts writing and prevents it from attaining the status of pure prose. Ishikawa is moreover making two crucial if subtle points in these paragraphs. The first is that virtually all modern Japanese fiction falls into one of these two rival camps and thus fails to qualify for his synthetic notion of pure prose, with past literary debates serving only to reinforce the dysfunctional keishiki naio dichotomy. It is, quote, around these two camps, the emaciated and insidious, that the old rancorous debate about literary value periodically flares up, end quote, he astutely notes. 
His second point is that Buffon's great insight was that the living image of writing is to be found not in the aggregate sum of its referential content, but in the mysterious combinations of words and phrases that express in themselves an infinite number of truths that are more useful and precious to the human spirit than the truths that form the core of the subject. Iskar tacitly affirms this Buffonian insight by declaring that only a full fledged mature écriture can re reconcile the rift between the formalist and pragmatist factions by positing the existence of a style derived unconscious content that recognizes the indivisible nature of Keiski and Naiyo. As he puts it, quote, and so these two kinds of truth, conscious and unconscious, together make up the composite reality of the written work, at once embedded in our real world, and also constituting a single discrete microcosm that moves of its own accord. End quote. It is precisely this dual nature of the authentic work, both autonomous and heteronymous, self-reflexive and historically grounded, that distinguishes it from the two deformed types of writing that have long dominated Japanese fiction. Iskar concludes his essay by assuring his readers that this new kind of writing that he is proposing, one that is composed entirely of such unconscious content, and thus overcomes the dysfunctional naio keishiki dichotomy, is not only eminently realizable, but has in fact started to emerge in recent years. Citing the parable of the moat and the beam from Matthew 7, 5 of the New Testament, he chides his contemporaries for failing to notice these fetal stirrings and for conflating this emergent form with existing shosetsu, which he demotes to the status of pseudo shosetsu or novel novels, as he calls them in what constitutes a tampe shosetsu, which belong to the narrow rubric of literature or bungaku. Iskar ends his essay with a pledge to expand his investigation beyond the rudimentary subject of writing, bunsho, toward the more complex issue of the shosetsu, the privileged signifier in his critical lexicon that represents the ultimate receptacle for his notion of pure prose. And it is precisely this task that he will take up in what constitutes a tampen shosetsu, which is the subject of my next chapter. In this chapter, I've argued that Ishikawa's essay form in content in writing, despite its discursive and meandering style, constitutes a rigorous theory of bunsho writing that obliquely addresses the most pressing literary issues of the day. In the course of my discussion, I clarified the four basic conditions of his descriptive theory of writing in general, unpacked his theory of purified prose, or what we might call écriture, and examine his proposed solution to the decades-old question of whether literary value is to be found in its style, Keishiki, or in its referential content, Naiyo. In addition, I showed how Iskar's notion of pure prose relates to the wider historical context of the various discourses on purity, while at the same time distinguishing itself from those other configurations. We may conclude by summing up Iskar's theory of writing as one that emphasizes writing's radical autonomy from and preeminence over immaterial speech, the individual author, referential content, and poetic residue. In the next chapter, we shall explore his veiled theory of the shosetsu, of the novel, put forth in what constitutes a tampen shosetsu, which builds on the tripart theory of writing that I have just elucidated. Okay, that's the end of this chapter. For the full version, you'll want to purchase my uh, tome when it comes out. Uh, I am currently in negotiations with uh, several publishers, uh, so I will keep you posted on that. That is all for now. See you all later. Goodbye.